going on, everybody? It's your buddy. It's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Checking. You don't see my pretty sexy face, so you know I'm not alone. A, it's the only JD in the YWC that matters. B, couple days out, it's the birthday boy. C, we're talking NXT, so it's super sexy Jake DeMarco. What's going on, brother? What's going on? Thank you for that beautiful introduction. So happy to be back here. I am excited for this Sunday's takeover. You know, it's going to be a heck of a show. I am excited for the fact that it's on Sunday as well. Gives it a bit of a bigger feel. Yeah, it does. It, we had we we did that before. I think it was um, I don't remember which takeover it was before. I, it might have been Portland. Yeah, actually, I, I think when when was... we talked about it being on the Sunday and it basically meaning it gets a weekend to itself. Exactly. Um, so I also no interruptions, no distractions. I also like the idea, and I mean, let's be real, like, they're all happening at full sale, so, like, the whole, like, takeover and then fill in the city name isn't happening right now anyway, but w as soon as they took the numbers off of WrestleMania, I would be perfectly fine if they just start numbering the takeovers, because, yeah, like... Yeah, I'd be fine instead of having to give them additional names or the locations. Yeah, like, throw, it, throw in the odd one here and there that has, like, a special meaning, like, obviously War Games is, is gonna be War Games, but, I mean, if... If we do 31, and then there's war games, and then the next one could be 33, I don't think anybody would care. No, to be perfectly that would honest with you. perfect. Yeah, they don't have to have... That would be 32. I'm, I'm with you there. Absolutely. Yeah. I like, even when they did take over 25, Triple H nipped it in the bud right away. It's like, yeah, I know there's a lot of people out there that think it's 26, but Arrival wasn't a takeover. Yeah. <laughs> so know. he just, like, I, told all the fans to that. stick it. Um, NXT Arrival, not takeover, so... I don't have nearly as much dread going into this show as we did going into TakeOver 30, and there's less build on this show than there was for that one. How does that one work out? I think they've better managed their time in storytelling in the pandemic era. I think that's what it comes down to. They finally have yeah. a better grasp on how to build and adapt in these harrowing times. I, I think that they're finally getting the idea of, how to best utilize the little crowd that they have and how to make as much an impact off of that as possible. Yeah. And consider they've, the they've fact well that like their major faces. their major champion and I'm assuming who would have been their major story point going forward immediately was taken out in the form of Kerry and Cross. So several focal story points I guess he was going to be part of. Yeah. But like pandemic pandemic times Obviously, there's certain people they just can't have there. They make all these plans around a brand new champion that was immediately ripped out from under them, and almost no build. And other than one match on this card that's pretty damn obvious, I'm looking forward to everything on this card. And losing Keith Lee as well. I mean, and losing Keith Lee, but losing Keith Lee would have been fine because he had passed the torch to Cross. So I don't, I don't know that yeah, I can. I, I know Triple H mentioned that it happened. That's the problem. Yeah, Triple H had mentioned that in the call. I don't usually do that whole like, uh, you know, listening on graduated. the graduated. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't usually do the whole, like, listening in on, like, you go to No DQ and you hear, like, the yeah. recordings of the Triple H business meetings and all that sort of thing. I don't usually go in for, like, calls. yeah, I don't usually go in for, like, uh, just, oh, let's figure out what that conversation was like. I mean, if something really big gets announced, I mean, I'll either hear it from you and Joe or I'll hear it from What Culture. But the whole, um, he, he listed off uh, the loss of Keith Lee, but the loss of Keith Lee was intentional because the the torch had been passed. But yes, losing it was planned, but not when they, they they didn't plan on losing, you know, yeah. their champion. So that was the the setback. You passed the torch to someone who was then not going to be present, who literally got Ballard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So really quick, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, Joe and I, or Jake and I, sorry, usually record on a Thursday, and he's uh, had a bit of a crunch today, so this is going to be a little bit more of a rushed podcast than we're used to, because he's got to go hop over onto the onto the Joe show and do, do all the uh, good out-of-nowhere things. So if it feels like we're banging through this a little bit, it's, it's because we are. The glitch in the back that uh, I was really worried was going to be Retribution coming to NXT, and thankfully it isn't. Yes. I've heard three different things on this. Okay. Two of them are awesome, and one of them is, is I'll eat, I'll, I said it on my review last night, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> if it, I've heard that it's an early, way before expected return of Karrion Cross, which would be awesome, but it would be like a Cena level of recovery. Yeah, if uh, you could pull that off that quickly. I've heard that it's a return to NXT for Ember Moon. Which would be awesome. I've heard that as well, which would be very interesting, especially because 
she never really got her shot in the main roster, constantly being injured. Well, she not not only injured, but I think they just they treated her a little bit like Balor. It's like everybody thinks she's cool, so we don't really have to do anything with her, which is like the yeah, opposite. Yeah, we didn't really need to focus on her. We didn't need to make her a focal point. We just needed to have her there. And yeah. she'll get cheered. She's yeah. there, and she does cool shit, and the fans will love it. We don't actually have to pay her any mind or anything. And she, like, in every interview I've seen her in, she seems like such a badass and such a decent human being, so fuck that logic. She really does. Uh, the third example, obviously, is the one that most people are talking about. It is, it's it's the return of, of Bo Dallas. Yeah, with these vignettes that they keep playing and saying that a former champion is returning, I mean, we're kind of out of options as to who it could be. It really does seem like Bo fits the, uh, you know, fits the crime here, but I'm not sure. I'm not sold on it being him yet, but no. you know, I mean, his I would have loved it to be NXT, Bobby Roode, but Bobby Roode. <laughs> I would have loved it to be Bobby Roode, but Bobby Roode showed up on Raw this week. Poor guy. I know, and it, that was a thought of mine as well, because when they said former champion, and I was going through, I said, you know what, Bobby Roode is not back yet, and we keep hearing that he's going to come back any day now, he'll be back, and then he appeared on Raw, I said, well, forget that. So. Honestly, if they were going to do an impressive former NXT champion, I'm not sure how many people will actually agree with me on this, but he's he's dying on Raw right now. Can you imagine the impact of a returning Seth Rollins? That'd be huge. It'd be huge. Uh, I think. I think much like Balor, it would be like, okay, whatever you did over there was was stupid raw shit. We can have the real Seth Rollins back because that's literally what they did with Balor. Like yeah, they they flushed the the smiley Finn, just happy to be here, and I'm gonna tell you some quippy some quippy things in an Irish accent, and got immediately back to a, an even better Balor than I would say he had in his in, in his initial NXT run. In, yeah, what straight he's doing shooting. Right now. Ass kicking, no questions. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, well, it, obviously, it goes back to the all the Bullet Club stuff that I have no clue about, but I'm starting to pick up the vibe, and and the vibe is real good. If they could have that sort of rebirth for Seth Rollins, because I'm sorry, uh, we're not going to get into it because it's not a main roster podcast that we're doing tonight. But the the Mysterio family shit has got to go. Yeah, it's overstated. It's welcome. It's been going on for way too long at this point. Uh, like fair fair play to Dominic, like he's decent, but we we need to stop like bring your mom and sister to work day. Yeah, I was hard on them on Monday as well, and I went back and rewatched it, and it, it wasn't the the you know brother and sisters acting. It's just what they were scripted to say that is so painful to get through. So, but I don't, but I don't, but my thing is I don't want to see conflict between people that have categorically been said by the company these these two women like Ray's wife and obviously Dominic's sister are not here to be wrestlers. They are here to be actors in the story. So yeah. nothing they do is going to have a value. And when you think about like all the eye-popping stuff from the horror show and all that kind of thing, I can just imagine... I could just imagine the 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 sigh of relief that that somebody like Seth. Never mind what we would think of him as the audience, but just the sigh of relief that Seth Rollins would have coming back to NXT. And I mean, you could run back the Universal Title match that was supposed to introduce the Universal Title between him and uh, and Balor at yeah. summer at, from at SummerSlam, SummerSlam at a take in a takeover environment. It'd be massive. It, that, that that would do. But because because we want nice things, uh, it's not going to be that, or it's not going to be anything close to that. It's going to be Bo Dallas, and as I promised last night on my SmackDown review, I'm going or on my NXT review, I'm going to somehow have to CGI myself eating a hat. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, start at the bottom, and then we'll get to the good shit. Add a little bit of salt; it'll help. Uh, don't mention salt when I'm event- I'm about to talk about Velveteen Dream. <laughs> First of all, okay, I have to get the one cool thing out of the way first. Kushida's awesome. They've done nothing with him. He's finally getting a chance to debut on a takeover in a singles match. That part of it is awesome. Yeah, that is that is a huge plus. Problem is here, I was hoping, as you had said as well, that they didn't have this match on the takeover card. I was hoping that it would be... I, I would have Kushida versus random PC student number five. Yeah. Than Velveteen Dream. And I wanted to take it, and I'm going to have to blitz through this quickly because we, like I say, we are operating under a bit of a time constraint this time around. I'm getting a lot of shit on social because I enjoy people like Matt Riddle, people like Austin Theory, etc., and I come down hard 
on Velveteen Dream. We we spoke a lot about the Velveteen Dream thing on our on our last preview podcast, and I think yeah. we both, we both ranted about it a great deal. I want to clarify my stance on it, and I mean whatever whatever you have to throw in. Obviously, I want to hear Absolutely. what you have to say as well. The difference between those things is a Riddle tackled it face on, and we talked about that a lot in the last pod. But also, um, I'm not a person that immediately hops on the Me Too speaking out bandwagon. I'm not somebody that's like automatically you're accused it happened. There is a stack of evidence that's quite public about Dream, and I as a person and quite as, damning. That's the problem. Yeah, I as a person and we as human beings, I think, need to look at it on an individual basis, because Me Too, as as a movement, as a hashtag, as a whatever, has been weaponized to the nth degree. Re- the wrestling community had a culling when when <laughs> when when speaking out happened. And to the, to the legitimate victims out there, obviously rightfully so. But you can't just... Yeah, things had to change. Things couldn't stay the same. Yeah. You know, the, the culture needed that wake-up call, but... Yeah, but there's a different, like, where, where I draw the line is, a lot of things fall under that purview. Like, you get everything from somebody who's been legitimately violently assaulted to somebody that walked by the boys' locker room and heard a joke they didn't like. Exactly. And that exactly. that is so fucking dangerous. So when I when I say Velveteen Dream, da-da-da-da-da, all the things that I've said about Velveteen Dream, all the things that I've said week after week after week in my individual reviews of NXT, it's because... Not it's not because I take one accusation more seriously than the other. It's like I've been told more. I've seen more from that. And I'm aware that Austin Theory has accusations against him. I haven't heard anything else about it. I'm aware that there are accusations against Matt Riddle, but I've also commended the main roster for allowing him to come out and address them head on. And I yeah. believe and I believe that the Velveteen Dream situation is a unique scenario where not only is there damning evidence out there, but more damning than the evidence is his silence and WWE's silence on the matter. And Absolutely. that and that is why this situation is different to me. For the people out there on Twitter, go suck a fuck for people that are just out there, once again, you know, hashtag spaz is racist. <laughs> but I don't I don't care if Velveteen Dream was as purple as his outfits. Yeah, it's right there. Google it. <laughs> We, we, we've, like you said, silence speaks volumes, and the fact that the the NXT WWE division, whatever you want to you know label it as, didn't really do anything to clear his name, or at least anything thorough to clear his name, really made it a huge problem. Well, Triple H took the helm as we as we said before. I don't want to tread too much old territory, but like going super hard on the I don't know what you guys are talking about. He was in a car accident, like. Yeah, that that was very troubling. Instead of saying, you know, by and large what they did, they just skated over it. Yeah. Anyways, so I mean, the it, match it is... Does. Fu- it takes away from what, you know, what, what could be a good match, what could be a good performance, what what is a, a good star. Velveteen is a good star, but I don't want to see him at this point. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable, and this match, I hope Kushida wins, and I mm-hmm. hope they don't have a feud that continues past this. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I, I, I try to keep the vitriol to a to a minor level. I'm not going to take my opinions of the person in their personal life and use it to sort of sweep over and all of a sudden think he's a bad wrestler. I don't think he's the greatest wrestler. I think he's, no, over, he's over, over pushed as fuck. But you put him in there with Kushida to just be a body, and Kushida should get the win. Kushida debuting on TakeOver should not have this looming over it. That's all I got. I want Kushida to win if Dream wins. I, I I don't know what to say. Yeah, it'll be a pretty big failure if they let Dream win this one. But even even all the other stuff aside, just having Kushida go into here for his debut singles match that that should be his to take. Yeah, I mean even even if Dream wasn't out there fucking diddling, and yes, I'll say it in the in the affirmative because it's what I believe. Um, Dream as a character is so dry right now that I don't see a point in in him getting a win. And why would you squash somebody's very first takeover attempt? Yeah, it's it's baffling all the way around, that's for sure. So I hope Kushida wins and gets out of there. But let's cheer ourselves up, Jake. Because we yeah, have we be- got four other excellent matches on this We card. do. We have beat the drum for a long time. And it's finally happening. It we is are getting the We are getting the underline it NXT Cruiserweight Championship 
on the card of a takeover. And if you, I said it to you the other night, you look Not on that, pre-show. you get that graphic. There's no kickoff anywhere on that graphic. Santos Escobar versus Isaiah Swerve Scott. They're really playing up the whole um, the cruiserweight uh, tournament vibe, where Swerve was literally the only one that's had a pin on Escobar yeah. in his NXT career. Which I think it's a great thing to focus on, and I don't think it was intentionally planned, but it fell into their laps, and I'm glad they're utilizing it. They are. I'll be honest. I don't think Swerve takes it because I think Escobar and his group are really quietly becoming a pretty decent group. Yeah, uh, him and him and Mendoza and, and in NXT. Yeah. And uh, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, you and I talked about Swerve in in reference to the North American Championship. I think Swerve is overdue for something. If it happens to be the cruiserweight title, I'm down for that. If it happens to be, you know, him getting diverted off of this onto another title pitcher, I'm cool with that as well. Most of all, I'm just looking forward to the match, and I'm just looking forward to seeing, as simple as it is, I'm looking forward to seeing that title on the show. Yeah, absolutely, because they've done great things with the Cruiserweight division since going and, and, you know, having it be under the NXT banner and brand. I really, I really like Swerve, but I don't think he's going to win here either. I think Escobar retains. It's going to be a very, very close match, though, and I think this could actually possibly take match of the night maybe the main event but i think that this one really has a lot to offer here these two men are so talented and they they really want to prove themselves so i think the investment of a lot of indie fans outside of wwe is going to tip the scale more towards the main event but as far as the work in ring uh you could be right and i think i think there's a lot of people that want to see that title now that it's being treated properly um the one thing i did say and i said I don't think Swerve is going to win, but the one thing that will tip the scales towards Swerve winning, more specifically towards us needing a babyface champion, is the other cruiserweight champion who has been very active on social media the past couple of weeks, claiming that he's the true champion, claiming that he's never been beaten, etc., etc. I've been trapped over here, they're having matches over there. We could see a return of Jordan Devlin and could. and have a very much um, the situation that they just had with the Intercontinental Championship on SmackDown. Which uh, turned out to be quite excellent. So. Oh, fuck that ladder match, dude. Other than so the two big ladder botches with, with Hardy, Jesus Christ. And but still, those looked disastrous enough that it, it, it you know made you tense. So yeah. they were able to save it, and it, it didn't look like a, a total all-out botch. Yeah, I will say though, even though he's a dickhead heel character, uh, I did bump into Jordan Devlin at a Destiny show. Yes, check off your Spaz Phoenix bingo card. Uh, <laughs> and he's a really chill dude. So if we get his return off the back of a babyface picking up that title, and you get ultimately that NXT undisputed cruiserweight championship match, and fuck, give me a ladder match between uh, Swerve and Devlin, and I'd be a happy guy. Yeah, but, absolutely. That that'd be a good uh, opening match for War Games. Because the last time, and I'm gonna go back to our podcasts again. The last <laughs> time we were able to talk about this title being on a show was at Worlds Collide when we were saying, "Oh, well, yeah, this is gonna be an awesome match, but like they're not gonna put it on one of the UK guys. Wouldn't it be cool if they put it on Devlin?" Yeah, exactly. and they did. Who would, who would and that? we haven't seen the title or Devlin in time and then we wanted to <laughs> and then we wanted to see Devlin versus Rush and we just got that on a random weekly episode of NXT. We don't need yeah, to talk about that. Got thrown out there. We don't need to talk about that. Um Escobar versus Swerve. If Swerve wins, it is going to reinforce my theory that we're going to get Jordan Devlin back sooner or later. I mean, I know Canada's a lot closer than Ireland, but they just managed to get Bobby Roode back for for Raw. You got to believe that some things are happening. Yeah, some, uh, travel some wise. restrictions are lifting and things are starting to change. So I could see it, you know, being not too far in the foreseeable future that this happens. Uh, something we should hit on really quickly. There's no tag title match on this card. I know. I was very surprised, but I'm okay with it though. I, I am okay as well because they haven't had time to set anyone up, and likely it just would have been a rematch again, and that would have been what their their third or fourth outing at this point. So 
I mean, they had that weird, like, you partner with him and you partner with him, and if you guys win, then your two teams can fight. And, like, Face the, off. The, and the, the, fan, the Fandango uh, algorithm <laughs> match or whatever it was. <laughs> I was really hoping, again, going back off of our, our TakeOver 30 uh, pod, I was really hoping that ultimately the story was going to be Legato Del Fantasma versus Brizango. And we didn't get that because the team that Raul Mendoza was on didn't end up winning that weird mixed up match. Yeah, mixed partner tag. It was going to be Undisputed Era or it was going to be uh, Danny Burch and Oni Lorcan, who are all great, but those are the teams that we saw fight in the pre-show at, at the last takeover. Yeah. Uh, I think the story will eventually be Legato Del Fantasma versus Brizango if they're saving that for TV. If they're moving the Cruiserweight Championship off of, t- off of being the spectacle on TV and making that the tag title match instead while they rebuild that division and letting the Cruiserweights get some pay-per-view shine and that's the trade-off, I'm 100% okay with that. Yeah, I'm all for it. That's fine in my eyes as well. I will say, really, really quickly, shout out to my own reviews, which is weird. Started watching NXT UK, and it seems like they are putting a decided focus on their tag team division. So, seems that way. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, but I'll, I keep my eye on it. Also, if you haven't gone back and watched it, go back and watch the match between Piper Niven and Kaylee Ray. They're both fucking amazing. You and I have heaped ridiculous praise on Piper Niven. It's all deserved. Absolutely. She's I, so I, great. I want her on regular NXT so bad. Like, I talk I'm, about... I'm with you there. I would love to see her, you know, back over here and full-time. I, I I, mean, basically, we've been saying for the past little while, where the fuck has Tony Storm been? But I'm almost yeah. more intrigued about how Piper Niven would transfer over now. I am as well, because I feel like as good as Tony Storm is, she kind of feels more, I don't want to say generic, but... They made, they made the mistake of bringing her over to continue the feud with Rhea Ripley, except Rhea Ripley was already over as hell. So yeah, I think I think they so. kind of fucked her on that. That's true. Yeah, it, that did sour her a bit. Okay, so there's a double sto- there's a double Gargano story coming up this Sunday. First of all, let's talk about Damian Priest versus Johnny Gargano for the North American Championship. Uh, very, very I feel quickly. like the odd man out because I don't like Damian Priest. I really just I don't enjoy him. I mean, I I respect what he does in the ring. I just don't care for his character, and it's just not something that gravitates towards me personally. And He's see, I'm bad. the exact opposite. I I don't particularly find him super electric in the ring, but uh, like for me, I'm a big fan of like Brandon Lee, The Crow, and all that kind of thing. So all the all the pomp and circumstance, all the theater, him coming out in the dark and like having the invisible bow and arrow that lights his his logo yeah, on fire. Yeah, like, John, I like the entrance, but I just like and he and he carries. I really liked this week him teaming up with Io Shirai and them calling themselves the rock stars of NXT. Yeah, that was uh, when he had pretty, so, he pretty when he had her to play off of. It was it was more like there was more of that cool element than just when he's out there trying to be his cool self on his own. So yes. maybe maybe we give him a not a valet per se because that's sort of an outdated theme at this point. But maybe like maybe he needs somebody to bounce off of to get that out. Yeah, that cool factor. As you're I saying. I was still happy as hell for him when he won the ladder match though, mostly because his name isn't Velveteen Dream. Yeah, and I realistically. Mean, Speaking. I was happy that he won just for the fact that it was he that won, and it, it was somebody new. So Yeah, I mean, we were both pulling for Bronson Reed a, a, yeah. in some way, shape, or form, but I think we both knew that that wasn't happening at the same time. Yeah, we pretty much assumed that that wasn't going to be the case, at least Bronson, not yet. Bronson Reed is one of those people that we're not seeing in the spotlight right now, but is getting wicked slow burn build in the background, and there's a lot of that happening on NXT right now. Like, for me... Right now, the slow burns happening in the background are are Bronson Reed, uh, Caden Carter, and Casey Catanzaro. Uh, and yeah, they're doing well with those two as a tag team, and they can build them to be tag champs at any point in time. Yeah, I mean they they have to tackle the monsters of Nia Jackson uh, and Shayna Baszler. Oh wait, I think COVID already did that. <laughs> COVID took care of that, and Shayna does not want you saying that you're you know she's spreading it. <sighs> No, no. See, the thing is, they got their MMA characters confused. It's Ronda Rousey that went on the impregnation vacation. Oh, see, Naya's all messed up. 
<laughs> well, we, we knew that. That's why we need Piper Niven in there instead. Another story for another day. Uh, I will I say. I would like to see Gargano win here just because I think it'd be cool if, if Candice LeRae won as well and have the Gargano household be double champions with them both holding the belts. I wasn't sold on this idea until I saw him. That last shot. <laughs> <laughs> that last shot at the end of NXT this week. Yeah, where, where he was basically proposing to her with the titles, and she was acting all, you know, flabbergasted. And, oh, my God, for me, really? You shouldn't have. Great acting. I, I've liked their home promos, you know, from the, the, the Gargano household. Yeah. I, for the most part, they've been good. The stuff with Tegan started to fall off the wayside a little bit. I think, you know what, as much as I love Tegan Knox and as much as it sucks what happened to her, she's got her so third bad. injury in a row. Uh, the promo storytelling side of things is not her strong suit. I hate to say that about somebody who's dealing with, with an injury right now, but I don't think I don't think they serve her by being in situations like that. Do the whole Paul Heyman, you know, don't focus on the weaknesses, but focus on the strengths. Let her do her talking in the ring until until because she's done a couple of the you know the video promos from home, and and they're not great. No, they're, they're... <laughs> like I hate to say it. But you know what I want here? They don't and have any passion, really. I I would love the I would love the idea of the the Gargano couple like being the new Triple H and Stephanie almost. But here's the thing, and here's the thing I would love to play off. There's a fiction out there, and yes, folks, I said fiction called t toxic masculinity. <laughs> I want, and plus this would with this would benefit Damian Priest as well. I want Gargano to go in this match and make Damian Priest look like a million bucks. And the the nitpicking that you and I are both doing on Damian Priest maybe help him smooth some of that out, yeah. and then have Larray pick up the championship and then watch him be a pissed off little troll that eh, even my girlfriend has a title and I don't. What the fuck? Ooh, that's a good one too. <laughs> like I, I I hate it. I hate using the SJW vernacular and toxic masculinity as a term is a fucking joke. But I mean, it's a fiction, and wrestling is also fiction. So play so that look up. look at what they set up, though, Spaz. Think about it. They had him have his arm raised by the ref before he checked on his wife. <laughs> he also used her as a shield against Keith Lee. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. That uh, was fucking that was great. No, but I would I would love to see, like, Candice LeRae out of nowhere goes on this huge, like, ascension to superstardom, and, like, with every success she has, he just gets, like, more and more fucking bitter and like the the super the super the emo the super emo johnny gargano that drives half the fan base nuts just <laughs> gets more and more and grows the hair out he starts listening to my chemical romance or some oh, shit really into the hot topic phase but i mean on on the on the behind the scenes level like yeah this is kind of a random match but like johnny gargano was right behind him going up the ladder to get the belt so he is sort of like the runner-up so there is a little bit of built-in logic there if you want to reach for it, but I don't care that it's a random match. Gargano, character aside, is awesome in the ring. He's going to do everything he can to make Priest look like a million bucks. Originally, I wasn't sold on this match happening either. I was like, why Johnny again? He just went for the NXT Championship. He just gets you know opportunity after opportunity. But then they sold me on the match, mm -hmm. and they made me want to see it. So kudos to them for that. I'm gonna stick with it. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't see it happening for, you know, per se. But I want to see Johnny Gargano win. Yeah. I think it'd be cool to have them both be champions. But I, yeah. I, I don't think that'll happen. But I, but I mean, if not, I mean, I, I'm a fan of Gargano. If they put a belt on him, I'm not gonna complain. But Gargano yeah. is somebody that they can put him in there with who doesn't get damaged by a loss. And we'll go ahead and elevate the match no matter what. And I mean, like he's they they accentuated it with the fatal four way match that happened a couple weeks ago. But he is one of the four pillars of NXT, and that's not going to change by him losing a mid card match to Damian Priest. Absolutely. Other side of that coin, Io Shirai versus Candice LeRae. Uh, there is the Gargano family story, all that sort of thing. I will say my favorite part of Shirai versus LeRae is how well they're building Shotzi Blackheart. <laughs> yes. Now. Uh, it's I, good. I, I, with Candice being the heel and Shotzi being the face, I would like to see that dynamic as well. That's another reason I want to see Candice, you know, go ahead and get the title here. Eos had the belt for a, a not a long period, but you know, a decent amount of time. As where Damian Priest just got his title previously, so for him to lose, I mean, that'd be his first defense. That wouldn't be ideal. Yeah, uh, is where EO can afford the loss here, and I think that they can continue with this program. That's what, I, I'm just really intrigued by seeing heel Candice as the champion, finally. 
And see, despite the fact that like they've given her all this character, they've given her all this story, they've they've hinted at this double champion couple thing. I don't see Candice LeRae because it's not it's not like an Oscar situation or a Shayna Baszler situation where oh my god, if you want to beat this person, you you better bring a fucking bazooka. But Shirai does have a little bit of that. And as much as I love Candice LeRae, and as much as she does deserve a shot to be the person in that spotlight, I don't think she's the one that's going to do it. But I think all along the way is, you know, she's brushed shoulders a couple times with Shotzi, and yes, I'm biased, Shotzi, Destiny, Spaz Phoenix, Clipboard, all over the place. <laughs> um, the last couple of you minutes know. of that Battle Royal, with them both fighting on the outside, with literally the monkey flip off the steps to get the yeah. win, on the back of uh, her non-title match against Shirai the week before, I think there's two builds that are happening right now, right? Because you got shot gunning her chest and for promos. Oh my god, that promo Twitter. was so fucking good. It was ri- it's ridiculous, but it's like the fireball thing we talked about last time. It's wrestling ridiculous. It's the ridiculous yes. that makes sense in wrestling. Out, but it works. But there's two names right now that are being built up kind of simultaneously, and it's Shotzi Blackheart. Shotzi Blackheart is having her moments like eliminating Shayna Baszler from the battle royal a while ago, and then her long lasting in this battle royal here, and the final moment on the apron. And she's having moments. She's having that amazing match with Io Shirai two weeks ago. That yeah, was. They want you to be able to recognize her yeah. and be able to pick her out from the crowd. Yeah, Shotzi's Shotzi's match, and I mean, I already was a fan of hers, but it even surprised me. Like Shotzi's match with Shirai two weeks ago was a coming out party for her. Oh, absolutely. So she's she having these like a million bucks, and it, so she, it only raised her stock that much more. So she's having these the these long, prolonged baby face, really, really rally behind the 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 hero type moments to really build your your investment in her. And then on the other side of the coin, you've got Rhea Ripley, who's kind of doing two things at once. She's kind of like bantering off all these ridiculous people that try to fuck with her. But also, she's one of the giants in that division. And what did she do? She took out another giant in a cage. She's going to be taking on another giant in uh, Raquel Gonzalez sooner or later. So she's, while she doesn't need to get the fans behind her because they're already there, she's conquering all these monsters before she gets her way back to Io Shirai. So what I think you're going to get, and unfortunately this leaves Candice LeRae a little bit out in the wind, I think you're going to get uh, one of them or both of them in a triple threat match with Shirai. Now, that being said, Candice LeRae is the heel. Uh, you'd love a heel to have two faces challenging. If you have LeRae versus Shotzi versus Ripley, that's fucking ideal. But then I'm going to be terrified that they're taking Shirai to the main roster. <laughs> it, I mean, that's... A hell of a you know way to build towards a, either a triple threat or to Shanti, so I'm I'm down for either way. Yeah, I mean I do want Larray to win. I do I do love my scenario of Larray wins, Gargano doesn't, and he gets all bitter as fuck because I think it'll be ridiculously fun. Um, I'm I we we see what's happening on on Raw. I don't want Io Shirai to be the next member of Retribution. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm with you there. Uh, I kind of love Retribution in in like a Shorten Freude kind of way. It's like Raw already sucks. <laughs> so if you're gonna put if you're gonna do a shitty thing, do it on the shitty show. Exactly. And it's it's like, I knew Raw was tanking, so that's why they made them Raw exclusive. Yeah, and they're all like Bane Predator wannabes. But you know what? At the same time, like we got to Raw this week, and apparently like all of Retribution has COVID, which is terrible because they all wear masks. What the hell? I, I noticed them not being there, as retarded as that sounds. <laughs> uh, that and, that and uh, Raw Underground. But, I mean, if LeRae wins, I don't think Shirai gets another kick at the cat later on down the line. I think they think about moving her up. So that's weird. Uh, the, like I say, the slow builds of Shotzi and Ripley are, I hate to say it, a little bit more interesting than this title match coming up this Sunday. But this title match this Sunday is going to be awesome. I saw this match, and I hate and I hate doing the raising my own yeah. hand thing. I saw this match in Toronto when it wasn't for the title on the same night that we had sort of a disappointing Mia Yim Shayna Baszler match for the title. Yeah. Now, now they've flipped the roles. I think they're both more set in their roles. There's more story and the title involved. So this is the version of the match that I saw live on crack. So from that point of view, <laughs> from that point of view, it's awesome. 
from that point of view, it's awesome. And I mean, we're we're overstating the obvious. The match the match itself is going to be great. You got two absolute pros in there. We're oh, yeah. we're we're just we don't even have to talk about whether it's going to be a good match or not. That's why we're spending we're just along for the ride. Yeah. Well, this is why we're talking so much about the story and what what they could do next and who else could be involved because we don't even have to question whether the match is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, we know that's that's a given. Speaking of a good match, uh, how about I give you Finn Balor versus Kyle O'Reilly sort of out of nowhere for the NXT Championship? Yeah, the main event. I mean, Kyle O'Reilly, as we knew, it was a, a, you know a main champion, Ring of Honor. He held his own as a single star for quite some time, and if you've seen any of his work, then he was excellent. So, see, here's the thing, though, right? And this is where I, I look at wrestling sort of the same way as I look at movies. I was talking to, I believe it was Heel Steven, so shout out to Heel Steven on Twitter. Last time I gave you a shout out on my channel was probably years ago, but basically he put up a thing on Twitter, it's like, oh, this this Kyle O'Reilly Balor match is going to be amazing. Anybody that's seen them in ROH or in Japan or wherever else they fought knows how great this match is going to be, and my response was... Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it for the first time. And then he started yeah. giving me, like, recommendations of, like, other times that they fought and whatever, and I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're missing the point. With all, due, res- with all due respect, w- no, with all due respect, you're missing the point, and I meant this in a positive way. Like, yeah. I'm, I, I want the newness. And, and my, my comparison is I'm a huge fan of the MCU, which is why I don't read comics. <laughs> Like, I don't want to be the guy that reads all the books and then goes in and tells the movie everything it did wrong. I want to sit there in the movie theater, you know, socially distanced from everybody else, and say, what does the movie have to show me? And I'm treating this match the exact same way. I like Kyle O'Reilly. The sit-down thing that they did with uh, with Michaels this week was awesome. Super simple. So good, though. So effective. And they're both, neither one of them's face or heel, really, because they're both so fucking condescending to each other. I'm like, yeah. that's that's going to build, and eventually it's a WWE show, so we're going to get the, you know, toss the table moment, and we didn't. And the, and the line... subverted expectations entirely. It did not go where I thought it was going to... The way that Balor... The, route. the way that Balor specifically, right? Because I don't always think Balor hits it out of the park promo-wise either. He doesn't. Um, but and the I way. But the way he summed it up, uh, he basically insulted him by complimenting him. Is like you, like I've known you for a long time. You have all the tools in your in your toolbox. You have everything inside you to be the NXT champion. If it wasn't around my waist right now, <laughs> <laughs> like that's so like the uh, like I I and, and again I, I don't I don't I don't know whether you want to say like condescending or passive aggressive, but I was like oh I want them to like bitch slap each other but it didn't happen and it made it better it's it is a really weird way that we got here because we had cross you know uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for like subjugate the title they did yeah. the, the they, did, they did the fatal four-way out of nowhere which i know divided a lot of people i loved the the iron man fatal four-way i didn't mind the ending at all i really really didn't um because the Initially, end- I did but knowing that we got the title match next week, kind of it, initially it burned my ass, and then I was less sour on it after you know the, the initial shock wore away. It's just because WWE has this constant attitude to go ahead and and you know they make these big announcements and these grand gestures, knowing that they're going to screw you in the end. So you get. But see, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was a screw. Like you, like you look back, no, at, no, you look back in the history of the Royal Rumble. Way. You look back in the history of the Royal Rumble, and I mean it hasn't happened a whole bunch, but we've had Royal Rumbles end in a tag where they've had to where they've had to fix it the next month at No Way Out or whatever. It's just it to hold over. I, and if you don't like, I I get why people don't like it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting down people that are of the opinion that they feel like they got a little bit gypped. My thing is that clock counting down to zero took about what five or ten seconds of of drama at the end. Five or ten seconds does not uh, erase the work that f- those four guys did for an oh, hour. No, absolutely not. No, it was still a good match. And, and it gave us Balor match. versus Cole the following week. And it was exactly. and it was so fucking good because what did we have? We had um, that that one really like super show NXT show they did last December when it was opened by Cole and Balor and it was closed by Ripley and Baszler. And they did kind of the same thing here. They opened with Cole and Balor again. Uh, with with Balor getting the upside this time, or with yeah Balor getting the upside this time, yeah. 
and they ended with Ripley again beating another monster in a cage. So it almost mirrored that show from last year. It brought back some of those feelings from that show last year. And I mean, nobody's going to complain about uh, about Adam Cole versus Finn Balor on a on a random weekly episode of wrestling. Like, be real. Like, maybe have your qualms about like how it was booked or how it got there or how we got together. But if I plopped it, if tomorrow somehow I managed to plop down another round of Daniel Bryan versus CM Punk with no build, are you going to complain? No, not at all. That, no way. And see, I get people's criticisms, but at the end of the day, look what you got. And the thing was, they keep coming up with new ways to, to do stuff. The, the Gauntlet Eliminator, now it wasn't particularly great for commercial TV. Like, anything where you have, like, synchronized entrances like the Royal Rumble isn't great for a show that has to go to, go to a commercial break. But yeah. as, a, as a concept... It's 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 Royal Rumble by pinfall. I've been doing I've been forcing video games to do that for years. I love that concept. I want to see a Royal Rumble where you only get eliminated by submission. It would take the whole show, <laughs> but it would be amazing. <laughs> like oh, people are coming up with all these wacky concepts. Oh, they're 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 like old school TNA. It's like no, they're trying new shit. You all are exactly. the same. You all are the same people that oh WWE is giving you same old shit. Look at the people that were in that Gauntlet Eliminator. You got Grimes in yeah. there. You got Kushida in there. You got friggin' I don't know Dream coming in with his interference, which <laughs> bums bums us all out. But I mean, like Thatcher, and then Kyle O'Reilly, who's who's a boss, and he's gonna have a great match, and I can't wait for it. And there's so many ways that this could go. Does it split there's, the? There's a lot of ways this can go. I I, I personally think that Balor is gonna retain here, but Kyle will get the title soon. Yeah, but there's so many ways that his success or defeat is going to ripple through the Undisputed Era. Like, does Adam Absolutely. Cole does Adam Cole rally behind him as his friend and the other two that are still being healed? He said that he was, if, if he wins the title that he would be supportive of him. So, I mean... That's, that's what Adam Cole said so far. Actions speak louder than words, we know, but... I mean, but is that setting up for, like, a, what, what, a Jericho Owens situation? Yeah. Are are, are we going to have the undisputed festival of festival friendship? Of friendship. <laughs> can you can you just see like him holding up a clipboard with the with the undisputed era logo on it? It was like, why is my name on this last shot? <laughs> <laughs> or do this they all do, or do they all turn on Kyle O'Reilly? Or does Kyle O'Reilly take the undisputed era from Adam Cole and Adam Cole becomes the face? Like there's literally. Like, this match and the repercussions of this match could go in any direction. We said before, with Adam Cole, when he had his weird, like, exhibition match with Pat McAfee, which was fucking amazing, by the way. Oh, so good. Uh, I, th I don't think it would But we, you and I talked before, like, what could happen to the Undisputed Era with this, with that, because, you know, they're all focused in other places, and rah de rah yeah. rah This match this, has this a lot more... This could be a more... turning point for them, you know, and... Could be their breaking point too, like you said. So there's. Or who, who do you think's gonna win? Honestly, I I'm. Oh. I, I still think Finn Balor, but I I would like to see Kyle. I just don't think it's gonna happen yet. You know Finn's what? Too new. Of a I just champion. I just I just had a thought because there's two guys that probably could have had a tag team title match on tonight's show, and I think it got written off. Uh, I think it was gonna be the Undisputed Era that would have faced Breezango if it wasn't taken off the card. And I think uh, they only wanted to have one Undisputed Era story on the card, which is, I think, yeah. a big reason why that tag match was taken off. Can you imagine this? Because Balor's not exactly a face. No. Balor. Not a full-fledged heel. More heel than a face, but not, not all out. Balor wins due to interference from Strong and Fish. Strong, Fish, and Balor become the new Undisputed Era or Balor Club or whatever you want to call it Ooh. and and they go to war with uh, whatever you want to call Babyface, Kyle O'Reilly and, and, and Adam, Adam Cole. Cole that would be something freaking else because I mean like you're not going to call them Undisputed Era if it's just the two of us if, if it's just the two of them I don't think but I mean again oh there you go there's your story right there there's where you get your return of Rollins, and you have a faction warfare. You got Balor, Fish, and Strong versus Rollins, Cole, and and O'Reilly. Absolutely, you know, and and that's the thing too. I mean, there's there's so many possibilities with this story, and and all of it seemingly could be excellent. 
that's what makes me even more excited. So I don't want I don't want to predict this because I don't want to even think about knowing what the end is. I love that I have no idea what's going on. Anyways, you're about seven minutes late going over to out of nowhere. So why don't you uh, tell everybody where to find you real quick? Uh, tell them about your charity thing for people that don't know, and then you can uh, tittle off. Yeah, you can go ahead and hit me up. It's at Countdown Ended on Twitter. Same on YouTube. And uh, you can always go ahead and catch me on the Joe Cronin Show on YouTube as well. We do uh, wrestling reviews live after every WWE and AEW show and pay-per-view. And I'm still collecting money for the Connecticut Children's Medical Center. So you can go ahead and check out my Twitter or go to extra-life.org slash participant slash countdown ended. So thank you so much, Baz, for having me. And I cannot wait to be back again to break down the next takeover or whatever may come. And you guys know where to find me or you wouldn't be here. Uh, I've been Spaz. He's been Jake. I almost messed up my own outro there. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I'll talk to you every last one of you later. But for right now, me and the birthday boy, super sexy Jake DeMarco, are tagging out. Bye, guys. Don't die, don't